welcome everyone. My name is Christina Iptoma and I am mom to Osteo Angel Dillon and Director of Scientific Programs at MIB Agents. And today on Osteobytes, we are talking with Dr. Christina Canal about cold atmospheric plasma as a potential therapeutic option for osteosarcoma. Really excited to learn about this today. Thank you so much, Dr. Canal, for joining us. We're thrilled to have you. And thanks um, also to our panelist, Vicki, for joining us today. Vicki is an osteo warrior and president of our MIB Agents Junior Advisory Board. So a little bit more about our guest today. Um, Dr. Christina Canal Barniels is the Associate Professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the Technical University of Catalonia, UPC. And she's also head of the Plasma Med Lab, Plasmas for Biomedical Applications Laboratory and head of the Medical Technologies, Biomaterials and Tissue Engineering Research Group at the IRSJD, which is the um, Institute of Research San Juan de Dieu, which I'm sure I didn't pronounce that correctly, but did my best. That's fine. It's okay. Okay. Right. And before joining UPC, she did different research uh, stages at pre and postdoctoral level in different national and international research centers. She has participated and led a number of research projects, as well as technology transfer projects in the areas of textile materials, biomaterials, and cold plasmas. And her research has led to more than 60 publications and several invited conferences. Her research has been recognized with different awards including the L'Oreal UNESCO Fellowship for Young Women in Science, the 2018 Early Career Award in Plasma Medicine, and the ICREA Academia 2020 Award. And her interests are focused on cold plasmas for biomedical applications, particularly surface modification of biomaterials to control parameters such as adhesion or biological behavior, also control of drug release from biomaterials, and therapeutic applications of cold plasmas for instance, in bone cancers. She's currently the ERC Apache Project's starting grant leader in a project in the field of atmospheric pressure plasma therapy. And her main axis of research is currently focused on the atmospheric pressure plasma therapy of bone cancer treatment in combination with biomaterials. So welcome Dr. Canal, and welcome to everyone joining us today. Please feel free to add any questions you have for Dr. Canal to the Q&A and we will make sure we um, ask those. Um, and before we get started, some announcements and reminders. Registration is open for our Factor Conference, June 22nd to 24th in Atlanta. And there really is something for everyone. We have scientific sessions. We also have wellness programming. We have an amazing Warrior HQ um, that is free to Osteo Warriors and their siblings, 18 and under. And you can register now on our website. We're going to have six scientific panels this year on biomarkers for risk stratification, uh, preclinical models, comparative oncology, local control, immunotherapies, and molecularly targeted therapies. This year, we're going to have some really great uh, discussion groups. Um, a couple of them, one's going to be about uh, leveraging canine studies to expedite um, bench to bedside for pediatric patients. Also, um, unleashing the power, patients with osteosarcoma who enable research and really talking about um, patient-powered research and how patients can drive that forward. Um, so lots of great reasons to attend this year, and we hope to see you there. Um, and this month in April, we also have two Healing Hearts Grief Workshops for Osteo Angel siblings. They're led by grief counselor Lori Krause, who is really wonderful. And these workshops are free of charge to all bereaved siblings of Osteo Angels who are at least 13 years old. Um, and I'll put some more information about that in the chat, but there's a session on Sunday, April 16th at seven Eastern and also on Sunday, April 30th at seven Eastern. And lastly, for anyone attending AACR in Orlando next week, MIB agents will be there. So um, stop by, we have a table at the Patient Advocacy Pavilion um, and say hi. All right, Vicki, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Vicki Hoy, and I'm president of the Junior Advisory Board, as uh, Christina already mentioned. Uh, I'm a freshman at Villanova in my, uh, my jail cell dorm right now, uh, and I finished treatment about 11 months ago. And thank you so much for speaking with us today, Dr. Canal. Thank you very much, Vicki and Christina, for this very warm welcome. Um, so I will uh, share my screen. I'm really happy to be here today. So uh, as um, Christina was, was saying, I come from the 
Technical University of, of Catalonia. So we are a polytechnic university. Um, I'm in the material science department. And yeah, I would like to show you the technology we've been working in the last years, which is based on cold atmospheric plasma and why we studied it for osteosarcoma and whether it can work or not. And I'd love to have your feedback during or after the conference. So don't hesitate to interrupt um, if you have any doubt or if it gets boring or whatever. So it is very briefly um, as um, it's uh, my first time here in um, Osteobytes. Uh, our university is in Barcelona in Spain. So yeah, we're in Europe, in the south of Europe. Um, maybe some of you know the city. This is yeah, a nice picture. We are by the sea. And we have the Sagrada Familia and yeah, many, many nice things. So our university is in fact uh, by, uh, by the sea, but which should be uh, very inspiring, but we don't go there that often in fact. Um, and we are uh, in the material science department, as I was mentioning, and we are part of, part of the bigger group of biomaterials, biomechanics and tissue engineering, um, which is uh, all this um, nice group of people that you see here. Uh, and we all work in different aspects of uh, tissue regeneration, organ regeneration, um, yeah, development of uh, bone substitute materials like calcium phosphates, prosthesis, etc. So working a lot on bone, and this is how I entered the osteosarcoma um, uh, field. And this is uh, our smaller group just working and focusing on plasmas for the biomedical applications. So the results I will show today have been um, uh, obtained with the effort of all this uh, nice uh, team. So I'm speaking of plasma, and if there is uh, medical doctors in the audience, I know that plasma can be confusing. So this is gas plasma that I'm referring to, and it has nothing to do with the blood plasma that we are all used to know. But in fact, because plasma, the gas plasma is like an excited gas, you have probably seen these balls maybe um, yeah, in some shops or in some museums that you put your fingers on and then you have these like rays or discharges that are moving around. Because inside there is a, a gas that is excited and it's emitting this light, right? And in fact, um, the name of plasma comes because uh, when uh, Irving Langmuir was the first uh, physicist that observed this gas plasma um, in the lab. And he saw that there were many species that were acting like a uh, um, group, and he associated that to the blood plasma. And that's why he named it after uh, the blood plasma, but it's a different, completely different concept. So. Um, Whenever I am, I will be speaking during the conference about plasma, it will be the gas plasma and nothing to do about blood, right? And so what is really plasma? I mean, plasma is not usual on Earth. Um, there are different kinds of plasmas. Uh, in lightnings, we have uh, plasma because we, we give a lot of energy to the air and then we have this discharge. And also... Um, Auroras, aurora borealis, I don't know even saying that properly in English. Um, these are also plasmas that we can see in nature. But in general, we don't have plasmas in our, um, let's say, daily life, apart from now plasma TV screens. There is technology uh, going on, right? So in fact, um, plas gas plasma is known as the fourth state of matter. And when I was in school or even at university, no one ever told me that. I was always taught that there were three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And I guess that might be the case for many of you also. Um, but it's very easy to understand what plasma is because in fact, if you imagine a, a cube of ice, it's a solid. The molecules of water are fixed in the cell. You give more energy to it when you heat it. Ice melts into water. We have a liquid where the molecules are more free to move. If we give more energy by heating the, the leak, the water, it becomes water vapor. We have a gas where the molecules are more free to move. And if we even pro we provide even more energy, and we cannot do that simply by heating, we do it by applying a, an electrical discharge, then we are able to break the molecules 
in the gas, or it, it, it was water vapor, so it, it was H2O, it was water, and then we break it to H radicals, OH radicals, ions, electrons, excited particles, so we get a gas that is ionized, and it's super reactive. It contains a cocktail of very different species. This is like the basis of um, our technology, this very high reactivity of the species that are present in the plasma gas. <coughs> but yeah, how to how are we using this in medicine? Here you can see this is this is my hands treating um, yeah uh, a, a bone that the butcher kindly gave me. You can see that we have small plasma devices that look like a pen, in fact, um, and that we can treat directly whatever surface, whatever tissue. And the nice thing about it is, is that we call it cold plasma because um, it is at room temperature. It doesn't burn. You can see that the yeah that the we did not burn uh, the this 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 bone here because it's at low temperature. And even though it looks like a laser, it has nothing to do with the laser. It's in fact this excited gas. So we have gas flowing through this uh, through this pen. Um, and then we apply electrical an electrical discharge to ionize the gas. And then we, we have the plasma that can act. And here we have some other examples of homemade uh, devices uh, while operating. This pink thing that we see is because we are exciting the air and then oxygen in the air, when it's excited, it turns pink. In the aurora borealis that I was showing, they are green sometimes because we are exciting the nitrogen that we have in the air also. And nitrogen is excited and it, and it looks green. So depending also on the color, um, means that we have different uh, species or coming from different gases, right? Um, so we are interested in biomedical applications. So what happens when we have the plasma that interacts with the cells? I was mentioning that in the plasma, we have a, a cocktail of many different things. We have electromagnetic fields. We have UV invisible radiation, photons because of light, reactive species, especially, and electrons and ions. And all this complex system interacts with an even more complex system that is the cell. And here, um, it, we know that this, despite we have these other agents, also the reactive species play like a, a primary role um, in the effects of plasmas in, on cells. And then we enter the field that is known as redox biology. And in this redox biology um, field, it is known that um, cells can respond differently when we give them different doses of reactive oxygen species because cells contain already reactive oxygen species um, intrinsically, right? So at low concentrations of reactive species, we can get beneficial effects um, like stimulating survival and proliferation. And if we get to very high doses of reactive species, then we increase the oxidative stress in the cells and we get harmful effects like damages in cells, uh, toxic response, cells are not able to repair. And thanks to this uh, behavior of the cellular response to oxidative stress, we can use the reactive species from the plasmas for selective cancer therapy. Um, and, and why is this? Because in fact, it is uh, known that both normal cells and cancer cells um, here they have in yellow, uh, they have like basal levels of oxidative stress, right? You heard about oxidative stress, the free radicals, um, they sell like creams for the skin to avoid aging, right? This is because the oxidative stress can affect the cells. So all cells have intrinsic levels of oxidative stress. Normal cells or healthy cells have, let's say, lower levels than, ca that can than cancer cells that have a faster metabolism and have already higher levels. So what happens if we go and treat the tumor area with plasma, we give them a certain dose in red of reactive species, of extra reactive species. Normal cells that have lower levels are able like, to compensate and survive. Cancer cells that are starting from higher levels of oxidative stress, we give them the same dose and they 
overcome the, what is known as the toxic threshold, and then they start dying. Um, so this is an, uh, a, a simple explanation for why uh, plasma therapy, we say, is, is selective. We can treat the same tissue and induce cancer cell death without inducing normal cell death. And I will try to show some examples later um, that we obtained in the lab, right? Um, so seeing these, um, many, many researchers around the world um, started the field that we now know as plasma oncology. Um, and there is people that have studied um, this on a, wide, on, a, on a number of cancers from brain cancer, skin cancer, breast cancer, even leukemia, head and neck cancer, et cetera, right? But there was a, a number. And like six or seven years ago, when I um, started thinking of that, I saw that no one was working on osteosarcoma. And then I asked myself, is this because it doesn't work or it's simply because it's a rare disease? So I was intrigued and we started working on that. But just to show you, um, uh, let's say a successful clinical trial that this is a clinical trial that that is going on on head and neck cancer um, where they are treating patients as you can see that the image is not very nice but this patient they have the the head and neck cancer and this cancer has the tumor and has infection at the same time so um, plasma is like having a double effect because it's killing the bacteria at the same time that it's killing the um, um, yeah, the cancer cells. So, well, this uh, is, is progressing, right? So with the device that I showed you, um, the, yeah, the strategy is to go and treat the plasma, either the cancer directly. Um, and I, I put a couple of examples here of uh, devices that are already in, in the clinics, in clinical trials, sorry. So this is a German device, which is called the Kimpen Med, but it's the, the same one I showed that we have in the lab. And this is the Kennedy Code Plasma, which is uh, starting right now on clinical trials here in the US. Um, this is the plasma during uh, yeah, treatment. But if we are thinking of osteosarcoma, well, this could be used during surgery, during open surgery to treat the area. But this, uh, the device, I mean, you cannot access the tissue uh, several times, except if you do surgery. So this is not very practical when we're thinking of internal organs like bones. So um, during these uh, previous studies, people discovered that in fact, when they are treating tumors in the body, there is blood all around, there are liquids. So um, they discovered that the reactive species, which are the main agents of the anti-cancer effect of the plasma, can be transferred to a liquid. And then eventually this liquid could be injected in the tumor. And this is where we have been working lately. And this opens two different possibilities or two different mod modes of action. The direct treatment of the tumor with the plasma pen that I was showing you, or treating a liquid to inject it in the tumor, right? So this is, and, and the difference here is that um, when we have the direct plasma treatment, we have all this cocktail that has the reactive species, the photons, the electromagnetic field, UV, et cetera. And when we are just treating a liquid with plasma, we just keep the more stable species, which are in fact the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species and ions um, that will interact with the cell. Dr. Canal, um, I have a question about just a couple slides back when you were kind of talking about mm -hmm. um, using it during resection. I mean, yeah. You know. yeah. And I'm just curious in the studies for other cancers that have been done, where where you're where you're actually having to do that during during resection, has it been used to actually um, treat unresectable tumor or to kind of um, you know mop up or clean up after resection? Yeah. Um, it. For head and neck cancer, here it has been used to treat directly the tumor with that resection, with that prior resection. So yeah, um, I, I I would say, um, according to my experience, that it's um, yeah better to treat surgical margins. Um, so it can be like a, a an extra 
well, maybe or a complementary um, technique during surgery also. Um, yeah, so the, there have been uh, so on clinical trials, um, there are some going on, not many, but uh, about maybe three or four or five going on for different um, indications. Um, there have been many uh, assays in vivo and, of course, in vitro. Here, for example, you can see that direct treatment is was bladder cancer, um, which was a tumor that was generated subcutaneously. And you can see that on the controls, the tumor growth uh, yeah, progressed. And treating through the skin, because this was subcutaneous, and they were treating, as you can see in the image, the plasma was just treating the skin of the mice, they could delay the starting of the tumor growth. So, um, yeah, this was interesting. And similar effects have been obtained by injecting plasma-treated liquids or plasma-conditioned liquids in the tumor, as you can see here. And um, yeah, the control disease, in this case, this is um, the survival curves. So the mice uh, survived uh, or lived uh, shorter times when they were not treated or when they were treated with uh, the plasma treated liquid, right? Um, and what was interesting, what is interesting is that in general, there is no effect on body weight, which is a, a true, a, a, or, or also on the behavior of the mice, which is a, a proof that there is no toxic effects like chemotherapy, because otherwise with chemo, the mice tend to uh, decrease uh, uh, their, their weight, right? Um, yeah, so there have been, uh, we are, as I was saying, more interested in plasma-conditioned liquids and plasma-treated liquids that we can inject in the tumor. Um, so we reviewed what has been done in the literature and what was interesting to see, and I think it, it, it's relevant, that um, direct, so injecting directly in the tumor and subcutaneous tumors, for example, which most um, studies were, were doing, was associated to a reduction in the tumor growth, but some other people tried to use the liquid in more extended areas, like for um, like spread peri peritoneal um, to, yeah, cancers in the peritoneal cavity, where they do like uh, washings with a high amount of the plasma treated liquid, and then this is removed. Um, and in this case, this was less efficient. And uh, I think uh, I am pretty uh, have evidence that this is because there is a dilution effect. So we could not apply this plasma treated liquid, for example, like chemotherapy intravenously to be delivered through the body. This has to be applied locally, and this is important. So we have sufficient concentrations of the active agent, the reactive species, in the tumor, right? So we would have like these uh, possibilities. Yeah, for very early stages, we could treat a small tumor directly with the plasma, or after tumor resection, treat the margins directly with a pen of the plasma, or otherwise treat, uh, inject plasma-treated liquid in the tumor, or even use, in this case, not the liquid, because a liquid would, would go away if we put it in a place that where is a, a void. But we are developing in our group, we have uh, been pioneering this, we are developing gels, hydrogels that can be put and left in place to deliver the reactive species locally for a longer time, All right? Um, yeah, so this is what I was mentioning. So we can either work with plasma-treated liquids, and I will show a lot of results on this, with working with a Ringer saline, or we, develop, we have been developing plasma-treated hydrogels to uh, be able to inject this in the, in the tumor cell um, eventually. So I will now go, let's say, a bit more on details on plasma-treated liquids treat bone cancer. And I would like to show um, a, a little step-by-step -step what we have been doing. So I will start with results that we obtained with cells on 2D and then moving on to 3D models and combining the plasma with other drugs and then the hydrogels. Um, so this is different preclinical models that we can uh, use to investigate uh, yeah, the new drugs, let's say new drugs um, for osteosarcoma or for any other 
uh, cancer. So the simplest option and what everyone starts with is with cells growing on a, on a dish, on 2D. We can easily do that. Tumor spheroids. We can also develop uh, tumor models. Um, we can culture tumors obtained from mice um, in, uh, in the lab, or we can use directly mouse models. So I will show uh, these four models. So uh, 2D cultures, um, tumor osteosarcoma models that we developed in the lab, and then these other two models, ex vivo and in vivo. Um, so what did we do? So we employed uh, a ringer saline. So the solution that is used in the clinics to, uh, for perfusion. So the, you know, the, the typical bag that is uh, put intravenously with like a transparent liquid and where all the drug is, is mixed. We, this is simply water with salts. So we use this um, that is already in use and we, we use this ringer saline solution to, and we treat it with the plasma gel. And as you can see here, we put a, a, a probe that turns pink as we generate more reactive species in the liquid. So you can see that as we treat the liquid with plasma, it turns more and more pink, meaning that we have more reactive species. And here we can quantify them. Some of them are peroxides. So this is the concentration of the reactive species as a function of the treatment time, right? So this would be like the dose we are generating, the dose of this drug. So more plasma treatment time, we generate more dose of peroxides, nitrates, and nitrites in the liquids. And we have other reactive species that we did not quantify all of them because it's very hard. And then what we do is we put this plasma conditioned liquid in contact with the cells that are seeded in a plate here just for two hours. And then we remove this, this drug, let's say this plasma treated liquid, and then we continue the culture normally. Right, so these are well. We can see that as we treat longer, we have more concentration of reactive species, and here it results about cells, right? Um, so this graph um, is is let's say it's pretty simple. We have one hundred percent is cells that survive completely, zero is cells that are completely dead. So here the three first columns in uh, orange stripes and gray. These are cancer, these are osteosarcoma cells. These are, are three different osteosarcoma cell lines. And these are human bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. So these are healthy cells, non-malignant cells in blue. So you can see that as we give them higher dose of this plasma treated liquid, the cells, the osteosarcoma cells are progressively dying. And if we still check day after, they will be at zero. So there will be no cells, uh, osteosarcoma cells left. And the nice thing is that the non-malignant cells in blue, they are over between 180. So they are able to survive this same treatment. And this is um, an example or a proof that of this selectivity that I was mentioning. So um, yeah, we can treat an area where there are also healthy cells without eventually producing uh, harmful side effects, right? Um, and here we tried to reproduce artificially uh, the plasma treated liquid. I was mentioning we are generating peroxides, nitrites. So will this be effective? Because this is a question we get, oh, why don't you simply mix hydrogen peroxide and nitrites? And then you see what happens. Well, in fact, you can see peroxides, they, they can kill the cells in the lab. They can kill the cells in the lab, but they kill all the cells. The, cancer cells and the healthy cells. Nitrates don't do anything. Besides, as you will see later, um, yeah, hydrogen peroxide in real life would not be useful because otherwise medical doctors would be using it. We have it at home, it would be too easy, I would say, you know. Um, but why is um, why are we seeing this uh, cell death in, in, the, in the cells? It's because, um, well, we have been investigating the, the mechanisms and here, uh, we can see each dot is this nucleus of a cell in the in controls and in plasma uh, treated uh, cells. And here you can see that this the plasma treated cells turn green because uh, we are producing DNA damage. And we are producing more DNA damage in the cancer cells, which are osteosarcoma cells on top, than in the healthy cells, which are in the bottom. You are seeing my pointer, right? Yeah, okay, great. 
Yeah, and we can quantify this. And in fact, this DNA damage is related to the amount of intracellular uh, reactive oxygen species that we induce to the cell. We are giving uh, external oxidative stress with the plasma-treated liquid to the cells, and the osteosarcoma cells increase their, their oxidative stress intracellularly up to eight times, while the healthy cells, they have a lower increase and then they are able to compensate and survive, all right? Um, and this leads to a specific cell death mechanism, which is known as apoptosis that we have seen, uh, yeah, we have checked. Um, so to summarize a bit, uh, and I did not show everything, but the mechanisms why plasma or plasma-treated liquids are um, targeting cancer cells, it's because, yeah, as I was saying, we are providing external reactive oxygen species that can then be go into the cell. They can be internalized through different proteins that are on the cell membrane and that cancer cells have in higher numbers so they can internalize more reactive species or also because the membrane is a bit permeabilized so they cross more. And then we get these higher levels of reactive species that damage the mitochondria of the cell, that da damage the DNA and they yeah, they produce a number of biochemical reactions in the cell that ultimately lead to uh, cell death. Um, but we could not stay just in 2D cultures, which is very simple. So we went to, into different 3D models. We checked the effects in slices of tumors that were gen this was osteosarcoma tumor generated in mice that we then cut very thin and cultured in the lab. But the good thing is that you have, well, you have the, the same, yeah, you have the tumor microenvironment there. So just very briefly, um, to show that when we were in this um, model that was is much closer to what happens in reality, um, we could see that uh, in this graph here, this is how much the cells in the tumor are, are able to survive with, in color, three different plasma treatment times, three different doses. So you can see that cells in the tumor, they die completely. We used the control, which was cisplatin. You know, cisplatin is a chemotherapeutic drug. It's this line in gray. Um, after 20, well, after 72 hours, everything was dead with cisplatin. And we used hydrogen peroxide as control, as we were saying before. And it did nothing when we had the real tumor. So this is why it's not being employed, of course, in the clinics, right? And this was interesting because we could uh, show that we were killing the cancer cells in the same way as cisplatin, cisplatin is here, uh, this line here, plasma treat condition liquid is here on the bottom at three different doses. Um, and the interesting thing is that apart from killing cells, you see that the, the, these images are less pink than those of the control because there are less alive cells. We also avoid the proliferation on the tumor margin. So these um, brownish cells that you see in tumor borders, they disappear when we treat with a chemotherapeutic drug with cisplatin or with plasma. So there are no cells proliferating on the borders of the tumor. Um, but as I was mentioning, we are a, a material science lab. So we don't have animal models in our place and we have to find a lot of collaborations to do these experiments. So what we wanted to see um, to have a real or as, as much as close possible uh, environment um, to the real life, we developed um, bioengineered models to mimic the extracellular matrix, which is one of the things. So it's, we have the cells in the tumor and we have the extracellular matrix, which is a lot of proteins that are acting as a barrier for the drugs, in our case, for the reactive species, and, and which are also, and which is also responsible for the cancer stem cells. You know, the cancer stem cells are a specific kind of cells. In the, in the tumors, we have a, a wide variety of different cells. And one of them are cancer stem cells, which are the ones that if they survive, they are able to regrow the tumor because they have, yeah, they are very potent. They are very powerful, right? So without um, going into detail, um, we wanted to have a situation where we could have these cancer stem cells. And we check different relevant uh, oncogenes uh, with relevant with regards to our therapy. One of them is, uh, yeah, these are different 
different of them. And then what we evaluated, one of them is the STAT3, and then what, what we studied is we tried to combine the plasma-treated liquid with a specific inhibitor of this STAT3 um, pathway, right? And then we tested this in 2D, in a bioengineered model, and also in a mouse model. Um, and I see that time is going through. Um, I will maybe um, jump some slides to get to more interesting things. So I was saying we are engineers, so we develop a tumor model in a, a bone tumor model in our lab. So this is a construct that looks like the trabecular bone, you know, the spongy bone, um, and that contains hydroxypatite and collagen like the bone. And then here we see that osteosarcoma cells to, and allow them to grow to mimic a tumor in the lab. You can see cells. These are different osteosarcoma cell lines. Cells grow very nicely here. They like it. And what we observe is, is that when cells are in this environment, they express um, a lot of antioxidant um, genes, uh, antioxidant proteins. And, and this might be a problem for us because we are using a therapy that is based on oxidation. So we went um, over uh, and try to investigate uh, this a bit more. And what we saw comparing, for example, I don't know, we can check the graph in the middle for SAUS2 cells, which are one kind of osteosarcoma cells. We were comparing cells grown in 2D, the simplest model, or in this tumor model, as a function of the dose that we are giving of reactive species from plasma in the liquid. Right? So in 2D, we quickly decrease cell viability. We are killing cells. But when we are on the 3D model, which is much more complex, cells become more resistant and it's harder. we need much harder doses to kill the cells. And this was repeated over, all around. And we also observed that in this 3D model, the cells were expressing a lot of, much more, the genes that are related with stemness, which means with the resistance, with these cells that are able to regrow the tumor. So, yeah, um, we could see this, um, I would say, better here. These are images, these are like sections of this tumor. In green, we have the surviving cells. And when we have red dots, it's dead cells, right? So green alive, red are dead. Um, if you see here, these are the controls, and here is plasma treated, oops, sorry, plasma treated liquid increasing the dose. So, if we take, for example, this first cell line on the left column, we just applied the plasma conditioned liquid, and we saw that in this 3D environment, the cells are so protected that we were not able to, keep, uh, to kill sufficient amount of cells. Then we combined with this inhibitor that I was mentioning of a specific pathway, and we saw that we were able to kill a lot of cells. The inhibitor alone does not do um, anything. It's this image on the top, right? So the combination um, had a very interesting effect that we continued um, investigating. Uh, and what we did is take these, some, these tumors that we had treated and recover the surviving cells, and then um, see what happened. And we observed that when we combined the plasma and the uh, yeah, and this inhibitor, this drug, we were able to completely eradicate tumor formation, tumor regrowth again. So um, yeah, this was very interesting for us. And then we went to uh, an in vivo model to try to test this in an even more complex scenario. So what we did was to generate, uh, yeah, uh, to in in inject osteosarcoma cells that were marked fluorescent, so we can we could track them in the tibia of uh, mice, and then we provided a daily injection to the after I mean after growth of the tumor, we started providing a daily injection of the plasma treated liquid, so uh, with high doses of uh, reactive species in it, and then we already gave this uh, inhibitor drug just three times a week, right? Um, and what did we observe? If we go to this graph in the bottom, you can see that um, this is the tumor volume, right? So as a function of time elapsed since we started the experiment. So in black, it is the control. So it's the mice 
that we did not do anything to them. The tumor grows and grows and grows like this. If we just give this inhibitor drug, the behavior is the same. The, the tumor even grows a bit more. When we treat with, we inject in tumor a plasma conditioned liquid at high doses, we can see it's the, it's the green line. We can see an important reduction in the tumor growth. And if we combine both things, this even gets, uh, the, the, the growth is much, much smaller. So yeah, this was interesting. We could quantify these, um, but uh, yeah, we think this was very promising results. And one interesting thing, is that there were no effects, no side effects on the mice. The behavior was okay. The weight was uh, constant or was the same throughout the experiment. So, um, yeah, this was uh, interesting. So, uh, oh, yeah. Dr. Canal, did you see similar results across the different cell lines for the combination? Yeah, yeah. In the in the tumor model, we did not try different cell lines in the mice okay. yet. But in the tumor models in the lab, we did. So yeah, it was comparable. We okay. tested up to four different cell lines Okay. in the 3D. Yeah, so up to now, we have, I have discussed mainly a first, uh, let's say, strategy using a plasma-treated saline solution that we can inject in the tumor and combine with the inhibitor to uh, reduce the tumor size, eradicate the cancer stem cells, and uh, eventually avoiding tumor relapse. And then I will brief, very briefly, just one slide and discuss a second strategy as we are in a material science department, we are interested in the materials. And, and I was mentioned that we could apply this plasma treated liquids to the resected area of, of the tumor, right? The resected area of the bone. But if we inject the liquid, it will be washed away very quickly. So we developed gels. And in addition to developing these gels, we combine them with bone regeneration biomaterials with the final idea that eventually one day the tumor resections can be eventually more controlled. We can implant a material that has some action on the potentially remaining cells um, here, so we can have safer margins and also include the material that allows bone to regenerate and regrow. Right, um, and we tested this in a rabbit model. So this was a test, a test for safety, where we used a plasma-treated hydrogen and a 3D printed um, bone bone scaffold. This, this was a hydroxapatite, like you know, a bone has hydroxapatite, and we implanted this in a defect that we generated in in the in the condyle of rabbits. And what we observed is that having this plasma-treated um, hydrogel does not impair bone formation. So we could eventually combine these plasma-treated hydrogels with bone regeneration biomaterials to eventually, in the same surgical, um, in the same surgery, remove the tumor and implant again the um, bone regeneration bio uh, biomaterial. Right. So well. This uh, is one of the things that we were also thinking of. And with this, yeah, I uh, just to thank the team and the funding agencies and all of you for yeah, uh, attending and listening to me patiently. <laughs> no, that was so interesting. Thank you. And um, yeah, brilliant job describing that. I, um, so a couple of questions and I what what was the mechanism um for the stat inhibitor plus like why why do you think you're seeing that synergy with the stat three inhibitor and the old plasma yeah um because and yeah um, the biologist in the team would be able to explain it much better than myself um but um yeah because the the stat the stat three pathway is um, very related to uh, survival and proliferation and stemness factors. So, and, and when we are treating with plasma, we are like stimulating um, different respiration of the cell. And then when, when we inhibit this step three pathway, we are blocking the other respiration pathway. So we, we, we stop the possibilities of cells to escape. Well, <laughs> Yeah. 
Got it. And um, another question, so, you know, in, in osteosarcoma, there's certainly, you know, the, the primary tumor obviously is important and local control there, but um, in osteosarcoma, the challenges are the lung disease and micro um, micrometastatic disease. And so curious how this might be able to have any application for that. I mean, I know it's been used in other cancers. Is there, mm -hmm. aside from bone, um, are there any opportunities for this for lung disease? Um, in fact, we have just started the collaboration with a company that is producing a plasma jet because for lung, um, according to our discussions with medical doctors, again, I'm not a medical doctor, um, but one of the problems is when they cannot operate because the, the tumor in the lung is too close to a complicated part. So that is where the direct, not, not the plasma treated liquid, but the, the, the pen with the plasma that then there it could be useful, I think. And we will, uh, yeah, we are starting to develop some models to see the penetration depth in uh, real tissues of the plasma jet um, to eventually be able to move to, uh, to, this, uh, to this part, yeah. I just had a, oh, Christina, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, but did you have a question, Vicky? Yeah, I was gonna ask how you thought this might be effective for osteosarcoma. Like, it just feels like osteo is so like random and kind of the, you know, such a big field of types of cancers there are. And obviously they went for the most, you know, common ones first, but why you might've chosen osteosarcoma. Yeah, uh, uh, because, I mean, it, it was like two things. I saw no one was studying it and then I, I asked myself, is this not working in osteosarcoma or is this just because it's a rare disease? And as I was in the university and we, I mean, a company would never do that, but I had the chance to, to, to try it. And I saw that this was a, a cancer affecting essentially uh, or a big part of children and adolescents. So I thought it was at least worth uh, investigating whether it could work or not. But yeah, now yeah, now we are trying to. I mean, uh, we are trying to advance this. We are discussing with medical doctors. If there's any here who would like to criticize and give feedback, I will be very happy. Um, but we want to move, move this uh, forward and eventually uh, make it uh, reach the clinics in many in some years, right? Um, so we protected the technology. Um, and we are we are also investigating how not only for osteosarcoma but trying to expand maybe to make this technology more interesting for a bigger pharma that will be the one who has to develop and then eventually in parallel so have both things right um, have the advance and everything we know for osteosarcoma that could be applied and also um, through cancers that um, affect higher number of people, I would say. Uh, but, I mean, it sounds like there could be an interesting, have you spoken to any interventional radiologist? Because I I kind of think about, you know, cryoablation, where it is mm -hmm. for unresectable disease, um, you know, to be able to kind of locally. Yeah, just, just with one. So we still need to discuss with, uh, yeah, more radiologists, if I can. Yeah. I mean, the first, the first one we discussed with the, didn't like it too much because he said, oh, we are already providing oxidative stress to the cells. But I think this can be a complementary strategy. And in fact, it's, it's a bit different because um, as far as I know, and I'm not an expert in um, radiotherapy, uh, um, you need to have oxygen where you are applying the radio to generate the reactive species within the tumor. And something or one thing that happens is that as you get uh, deeper in the tumor, it gets more hypoxic, so there is less oxygen. So there is less reactive species being created. He here on our, with our strategy, we are providing the reactive species from outside completely. So we are not dependent on whether the tumor is hypoxic or not. That might be a difference, um, not for plasma to work alone, but uh, to, yeah, to help. To, we just had another question um, come in the chat, which I hadn't even considered, but is the pen an expensive tool? 
No, no. I mean, I could buy one in the lab. The one I bought is around, uh, it's less than 20,000. I mean, of course, it is expensive if you want to buy it on your pocket, but I don't think it's too expensive for a hospital. Yeah. And what is the, um, so I know the, the idea of using the um, cold plasma and putting it at hydrogel and then putting it in, in an implant, basically, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, and so is it a pretty durable shelf life, I guess? Like when you create the, the plasma, is it just stay in that reactive state for? No, not forever. Okay. In fact, in fact, we are studying which, which would be the, the, best, the best way to commercialize it. Um, whether it's better to produce it on site because the reactive species, as they, their name says, they are reactive. So, I mean, some of them are stable. They can last up to a week eventually, but we have to be sure which is the right time frame. So maybe it's better to generate it very close to the hospital and ship it or maybe in the hospital and use it immediately after. I mean, there is possibilities, but not that you can like a drug that you can store it for months. So if it goes in in a um, implant, I guess is that I mean that sounds like that might be more of a short term um, mm -hmm. benefit in the implant. Uh, sorry, you mean, I, uh, I didn't understand. So exactly. it's like one of the applications, I think you, if I was understanding correctly, is yeah, that to, to, yeah, to mix it with an with a bone implant, but this can be done on site. I mean, right, because the implant is porous, and then you simply mix it there and you apply. It. Yeah. Uh, but then would the benefit once the implant is in in place, would it would it be a pretty short term benefit then? If it's the Ah. Yeah. Ah, I understand. Yes. Um yeah, I, I would say so what we have seen is that the effect of the plasma, I mean, we can apply it for just one hour or two hours and then we see effects over days. But of course it's not an effect that lasts one month. So in the trial, that's why in the in the mouse uh essay. We are injecting every day. We are trying to delay this with the gels to have maybe a more separated delivery. So it can be, I don't know, twice a week or eventually once a week, but we are still working on that, yeah. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, what is the half-life of the reactive species this plasma is creating in liquid? Yeah, in the liquid, it depends a lot on the um, on the liquid that you're using, because the kind of liquid you're using changes the reactivity and how much the species are stable. Um, but it can go from, uh, yeah, from days to weeks, depending on which liquid you are employing. So yeah, this has to be studied case by case. I mean, in the one, the example that I showed in the Ranger saline, it's relevant, uh, it's, it's stable up to one week at least the species that we are controlling now, which are not all of them, but which are the longer lived species. And in fact, we are now testing um, the biological effects with aged solutions that we are now starting with. I mean, up to now we checked the mm -hmm. chemistry, how stable this is, but now we want to see, okay, because we cannot measure everything that is in the solution eventually. So we will uh, just see, yeah, a different shelf lives, how this is still effective on cells, and this would be much, uh, yeah, a good indication. I think there might have been one other question from audience. Yeah, uh, the last one was what kind of plasma uh, you're using, and is it glow discharge? Yeah, well, there's there's different discharges, but this is a, yeah, it's a glow discharge. It's a, in fact, it's, it's a jet that is based on a glow discharge. So the one I was showing, the commercial one, is uh, it has two electrodes. So we have the gas flowing. Imagine this is the pen, so that we have the gas flowing in through the through the tube inside the pen. We have an electrode here and another electrode around. Um, yeah. There's different configurations. I mean, the ones we have tested are yeah, plasma, plasma jets with different frequencies. 
Uh, and then Dr. Canal, you mentioned, um, well, you showed that example of the, it being used for head and neck cancer. Hmm. Are there any um, clinical trials underway in other cancers currently? Yes, there is this one in the USA from the Kennedy uh, plasma, but I am not able to remember now on which, pla on which country is he applying that. I'm sorry. Because okay, it, it, it didn't start. I mean, I, in fact, I was just discussing with the, the head of the company um, not long ago. They are starting. It's not osteosarcoma, but, um, I, but I don't remember. It was a soft tissue cancer. Okay. Was it a, a soft tissue sarcoma or? Mm, not, but I don't, I don't think it was a sarcoma. Okay. But, but don't want to say what is not correct because I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't want to put you on the spot. Um, well, so interesting and so looking forward. And I thought, I wish we actually had a whole nother hour to talk to you about your preclinical models, um, especially since you're a bioengineering lab. Really mm -hmm. interested to actually hear more about that. Um, but unfortunately, we're out of time. And so thank you so much for joining us today, um, especially at your very late hour. Um, and so we appreciate you coming on Osteobites and making it better for bone cancer patients. And more information on this and all Osteobites can be found on YouTube, on our website at mibagents.org, and at your favorite podcast place. And next week on April 20th, we're going to be dropping a new episode of Osteo. Um, Osteo Warriors Camille and Mia will be discussing navigating scanxiety. Um, so make sure you check that out. It's going to be available on our website next Thursday. And then we're going to be back with Osteobites on Thursday, April 27th. We're going to be talking with Dr. Bang Huang, um, who's a professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Montefiore Medical Center and the University Hospital for Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And he's gonna be sharing his work on SCF skip 2 protein complex as a therapy for osteosarcoma by blocking the mutational effects of RB and P53. So you can find our Osteobites lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have any ideas for any future topics that you'd like to hear about, please share them with us at events at mibagents.org. Um, thank you again uh, to Dr. Canal and Vicki for spending an hour with us today and for all of you um, for being here with us on Osteobites. Um, make sure you check out Osteo next week, Thursday, and we hope to see you back here on Osteobites on April 27th when we talk to Dr. Bang Huang. Thanks so much, Dr. Canal. Thanks, Vicki. Thank you very much for inviting me. Bye. Okay. Right, bye. <laughs>